Kirk, why don't we start by uh, here we are and what we're doing. Uh, right. We are here in Geneva, Switzerland at the Thorium Energy Conference 2013. We've enjoyed two days of the conference and we are heading to the President Wilson Hotel for the conference banquet. And we're riding the uh, very nice and clean public transportation system here in Geneva. I think there are, are still some people that, that uh, maybe have misconceptions about molten salt reactor technology and what it can do. I was told to turn off the camera for one talk and then that's the talk that all hell broke loose. He talked about potential uh, rollout of new nuclear power in the UK uh, based on fast reactors, based on molten salt reactors, molten salt fast reactors as well, which are kind of a fusion of the two ideas. And, and he showed a variety of deployment scenarios. And I disagreed with uh, one of the numbers that he used in the talk and, and showed him uh, my reference to that. I, just this evening though, while we were waiting, I found out a strange thing about apparently uh, the British don't view that their current plutonium inventory could potentially be used to start nuclear reactors. It's sort of a labeling problem. Go and say, okay, if um, we have 100 tons of plutonium and we want to get rid of it, then maybe burning it up in a molten salt reactor might be a better idea than throwing it away. Noted one guy was complaining about uh, molten salt fuel carrying the uh, Molten salt carrying the fuel is being far more riskier than solid fuel. Yeah, yeah, Dr. Rubia uh, said that, and, and you know, of course, I fundamentally disagree. I think uh, molten salt carrying fuel is far safer than existing uh, nuclear technologies because we would be able to uh, remove the driving forces for uh, the release of radiation. We'd remove uh, the pressure term, which is in reactors today, they're operating under great pressure. If that pressure is lost, the, the water will flash to steam and, and there's a potential for the, the core to be uncovered. And that's, that's not good. Uh, that's why we have emergency cooling systems is to mitigate that effect. But I see moving to molten salt fueled reactor technology as a way to get rid of all the stored energy term problems that we look at in today's reactors, whether it's pressure, whether it's chemical reactivity, uh, even the potential of the fission products in the fuel itself to be released uh, in fluoride fuel, which is what we would use in a molten salt reactor, those fission products are bound up very tightly in, in, in salts, in a, in a salt formulation where they're not volatile, they're not going to release to the environment. And that's a major, major advantage of using molten salts as a, as a fuel. So I think, I think some of those advantages had maybe not percolated to some of the, the people at the, uh, at the conference. Do, well, is it kind of odd then that there's so many people in the that are throwing proponents and they, there's so much disagreement within that community itself, it's kind of hard to imagine what the um, different conceptions of things might be outside of the thorium community. Yeah, <laughs> my, my experience at NASA was good preparation for this because I've seen engineers go in a room and agree about 97% of something and argue to the death about the last 3%, you know, so I'm, I'm used to uh, engineers and technical people and scientists throwing rocks at each other even when any normal person would look and go, wow, you guys are in broad agreement about the most important aspects of what you're working on. In the old type of reactors, uh, you can take out the, the fuel and reprocess in a similar way as you would reprocess the salt in, a, in an online processing of a molten salt reactor. Um, and so I was wondering why has that uh, reprocessing of old fuel not come to a level before where we can kind of reuse that technology in MSR designs today? That, that's actually a very good question. Uh, the, the short answer is it has been looked at before. What you're talking about is, is taking oxide fuel, what we use today, ceramic fuel, and fluorinating it. And, and that has been considered for decades, even all the way back to Oak Ridge. The, the reason it hasn't been pursued up to this point is because that's not a very good technique if you mean to put it back into oxide form. If you want to you know, take an existing ceramic fuel, reprocess it, make new ceramic fuel, going through a molten salt step is, is not the best way to do it. On the other hand, if you want to take existing spent fuel and prepare it for use in a molten salt reactor, then it is a good step to use some of the exact same techniques you're going to use to process molten salt fuel. The main steps are hydrofluorination, which will turn all the oxides into fluorides, and then typically another fluorination step after that, which will remove uranium, neptunium, and, and some of the other components. And so, yeah, that, that has been looked at a long time, but the, the salient difference being that if you're moving from what we have today to a molten salt reactor, yes, that's, that's, a, that's something you want to look at. It's the way you want to go. Can you just list off all the things that have to maintain their state 
in order to maintain criticality. Yeah, and, and this is an important aspect of when you're talking about a thermal spectrum reactor of any kind, of which Lifter is a thermal spectrum reactor. I bring that up because some of the reactors in the conference were fast reactors, and what I'm about to say doesn't necessarily apply to fast reactors. But in a thermal reactor, you have to have fuel and you have to have moderator, and they're both essential to the operation of the reactor. The moderator is slowing down the neutrons that are coming off the fuel, and those slowed down neutrons then go into the fuel and cause fission reactions. So for instance, with a lifter, uh, a thermal spectrum molten salt reactor, inside the core is a lot of graphite, and that graphite is the moderator. If something happens where that fuel drains away from that graphite, criticality is no longer possible. The reactor's subcritical, fission stops, and there's no way to uh, restart it without reloading the fuel back into the core. So in the event that uh, somebody, you know, pokes a big hole in the outside of the reactor vessel, and this is still, you know, fairly, fairly thick nickel alloy, uh, even if the, the fuel came out and then drained into the drain pan, uh, it's not going, criticality is not possible. Uh, Recriticality, they, they tend to call it. Now in a fast reactor, on the other hand, you don't depend on moderator. You put enough fuel in the reactor so the criticality is possible even without moderator. In those scenarios, if there's a drain or a spill or something, you need to be careful about what geometries it could get into because recriticality is not from first principles impossible. It may be impossible in the design you've designed, but that becomes design specific. Whereas in thermal reactor, it is just impossible. Outside of, of the lattice of moderator, you, you can't have a criticality set up. As far as a criticality event due to accident, uh, AD, ADS doesn't really have that up on thermal reactors, right? Because yeah. you just can't, it just doesn't seem very likely that you're going to have that kind of a situation in a thermal reactor. Well, uh, another thing is if we've designed the reactor, as we should, with a strongly negative temperature coefficient, it will be strongly self-controlling. And so if the reactor has an excursion, uh, you recall when we interviewed Sid Ball at, when we were at Oak Ridge. And Sid talked about a time when they inadvertently took the molten salt reactor supercritical. But it didn't, they didn't mean to, but it didn't last very long because the reactor had such a strong negative temperature coefficient that it returned to criticality very quickly without any damage or, or, or difficulty. And so that's a, that's a really nice feature about, reactors want to be critical. If they have strong negative temperature coefficients, if they're subcritical, they want to be critical. If they're supercritical, they want to be critical. It's almost like a plane that has a, a built-in uh, control mechanism to where if it goes in a dive, it wants to level out. If it goes up, it wants to level out. Stable it's, it's stable equilibrium, yeah, dynamically stable system. And that same thing applies to these reactor designs. And in a thermal reactor, achieving a, a strongly negative temperature coefficient is a much more straightforward proposition uh, than, in, than in a fast reactor. It, it can be done but it's easier to do in a thermal spectrum reactor. There's a lot of options. A lot of those options are connected with the process of moderating neutrons. Uh, so you change something about that process and it helps you achieve a strongly negative temperature coefficient. The graphite in the molten salt reactor, is that a moderator? Yes, that's the moderator in the reactor. Neutrons go in the graphite, they hit the carbon atoms, they lose energy, they slow down. And is the molten salt also a moderator? To some degree, but the graphite does the majority of the moderation in the molten salt reactor. I think the NNL guy asked a question about the speed with which the, um, the uh, freeze plug and oh, yeah. drain tank... And that was something I wanted to address, yeah. Uh, there was a question brought up about how fast the freeze plug could act uh, to release the fuel because of conduction through the salt. And, and that's a very design-specific answer. Um, for instance, in the design we're working on right now, the freeze plug is located at a point in the loop where the temperature is the median temperature. And so if the inlet temperature goes down, the outlet temperature goes up, the median temperature is still the same. And so the answer is, 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 is we've thought about that and considered that in, in the design of the freeze plug and, and, and uh, tried to make sure that that's not going to be a problem. So you're not going to rely on conduction through the salt in order to activate the, the, or in order to thaw the freeze valve. So I think what he was saying was, it's something you need to design properly. If you're doing a two fluid reactor, what happens if something, uh, if the graphite lets fluid from one half into the other half, or from? It's, it's really a, it's a, it's an inconvenience, but it's not really any, any serious problem. It means you get a little bit of, uh, probably a little bit of thorium into your fuel salt. The, the blanket salt is just, lithium fluoride, beryllium fluoride, thorium fluoride. So if there was a 
uh, leak between the blanket and the core, it would show up as a little bit of thorium beginning to intrude into your fuel salt. And what you'd probably do is you'd shut the reactor down, repair it, and let the thorium just burn out in the fuel salt, because it'll burn out pretty quickly. But is that a super criticality? No, if anything, it would quench, it would, it would start pushing the reactor more subcritical than anything else. So it would be more of an inconvenience to the operators than any sort of substantial accident. Uh, some substance that can leak from the primary loop to the secondary loops that is difficult to keep. Oh, tritium? Tritium, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah, and so tritium, tritium is a legitimate concern. It's something we worry a lot about because the presence of the lithium in the salt is, is where the tritium is, is generated. And tritium is an isotope of hydrogen, and hydrogen will permeate through metals without too much trouble. And so uh, it's one of the reasons we advocate pretty strongly for the use of a gas turbine power conversion system, because inside the gas loop, uh, there's the opportunity to capture any hydrogen, including tritium, and uh, convert it to a, a non-volatile form. Tritium is a legitimate, it's a legitimate concern, and it's something that has to be addressed in any molten salt reactor design that uses lithium fluoride. Like, is it possible just to clean up the secondary loop every couple of months, or...? Well, we actually assume that, uh, in our design, we assume the tritium all makes it to the, to the gas turbine and the gas turbine is where the, the tritium capture happens. In reality, some of it will get captured in the fuel salt, some will get captured in the secondary salt, but we're proceeding on the assumption that it all makes it through there to the, the gas loop, and that's where ultimately it will be captured. Uh, in reality, we will try to interdict tritium at each stage, but it's, it's going to be something that will ma be made, and it's going to be something that will permeate. It's just the reality of that material. What is it about the gas loop that it ends up there? Because if you use a gas in the gas loop that has no hydrogen, you know that any hydrogen that's there is, is tritium that's made its way in from the primary system. So it's a good place to catch it. But will it decay away or how does it... Uh... It has a 12-year half-life. If you, if you have a, if you have a, a, a watch that uh, has a, a luminous dial, that's tritium. Yeah, in fact, uh, if you see exit signs in the United States, you'll notice they're not plugged into anything. It's tritium that makes them glow. So. Can you get that in a modern day watch or is that the old school? Yeah, you can get it in modern no, you can get it in modern day watch. The old school watches had radium. Now they uh, now they use tritium. But uh, tritium has a twelve year half life. If you uh, if you recall the movie Spider Man two, that was what Doctor Octopus really wanted to get his hands on was tritium. And I remarked to my wife that well yeah, that is an incredibly valuable substance that would be really, really hard to get. So <laughs> One, one time that, you know, Hollywood got it right. The uh, PSI guy put up a graph, the farmer curve, and he puts the uh, liquid fuel reactors on the uh, more, more, the greater probability of failure with lower consequences. Yeah, I could not understand that graph at all. I, I looked at that and I thought, wow, I completely disagree with you on that, and I really would want you to substantiate your argument before... Uh, yeah, I, I, I found that graph befuddling. Okay, I think he was going for a more not to offend everyone else in the room kind of thing. Yeah, I, I was ready to take the red dot and move it all the way down to the bottom corner and go, yep, yeah, no probability and no consequence. <laughs> so do you find the, this conference to be accelerator heavy? Well, we've only two days into it, so we've got two more days to go, and I know the last two days are going to have a lot of talks about accelerator-driven systems, so... Well, it is soon, so... We are sitting you know, on top of one of the most magnificent particle accelerator, the most magnificent particle accelerator in the world. Are they going to let you take the cameras down on the uh, tour? I assume so, I don't know. Oh, there you I go. They, they Interspersed footage see. of cool accelerator. <laughs> <laughs> see, I've, I've been around Gordon so long, now I can like make the video in my mind myself. You know?